welcome to a special episode of the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And David, I'm David Leary. Yeah, and I'm here with David Leary, my co-host, and we've got an amazing panel for you today to talk all about the SVB collapse. What does it mean for accountants? What does it mean for your clients? What does it mean for this week? Uh, we're eager to talk with you, ask your questions in the chat. We've got folks here with us in the webinar. There's people on LinkedIn. There are hundreds of you. So we will do our best to get to all of your questions and uh, help you sort this out. So first, I want to start with a very, very quick timeline of events. So if you weren't addicted to your phone and watching what was going on on Twitter and on the news this week, you need to know. But first, a disclaimer. None of this is tax, legal, accounting, or investment advice. These are our personal opinions. Consult with your advisors for individual advice. And now let's talk about what happened. Quick timeline of events. The SVB sold 21 billion of securities at a 1.8 billion after-tax loss on Wednesday. They also announced that they were raising fresh capital by selling new shares. On Thursday, the stock price plummeted after SVB announced it sold all of the available for sale securities in its portfolio and downgraded their forecast. The CEO said to stay calm, but the VCs were not reassured. They freaked out in their group chats, and Peter Thiel and others started telling their startups to pull the money out. $42 billion in deposits were pulled. That is greater than 25% of their deposits, all in a single day. On Friday, the trading in SVB shares halted. California regulators put SVB into receivership under the FDIC. Janet Yellen said she was monitoring the situation, and payroll and payments in process were frozen. On Sunday, thank God, regulators stepped in to guarantee deposits over the 250000 FDIC insurance limit, which was very important because 97% of deposits SVB were over that limit, and there will be no bailout for SVB investors. So depositors will be made whole, but no bailout for the investors. And that is the quick timeline of events. Now let's get to the discussion. We've got well, to just to, just to, you got to add this real quick though. Oh yes, and Matthew on Sunday, May. Sunday we also announced that the timeline for Signature Bank was ten billion got got called on Friday. So that on the same press release, the the third largest bank collapse was Signature Bank on Sunday. All this stuff is going to apply to them too. Okay. Yes, and and yes, we had one other bank that was uh, affected by this shut down in New York, and they're going to be made whole as well. So that and that was a crypto bank, right, Matthew? Well, they, they banked a lot of crypto, but they did a lot of tech and PE uh, kind of companies as well. All right. Well, so you can see we've got Matthew May of Acuity on the broadcast today. We also have Shay Schramanker. We've got Mike. Uh, Mike, how do you actually say your last name? I, the umlaut gets me. Yeah, thanks for asking. It's actually, um, think of Mo as in Mo Yalon and G's and put them together, Mo Yis. Mo Yis. Mike Mo yeah. We got my co-host David Leary and Ray Ariano. Welcome, guys. Hello. All right. So let's talk first about the immediate impact on apps, firms, and clients. And David, I know that you have been preparing a list of all the affected apps. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so I think Thursday night is when it really hit me. And I actually almost texted you, Blake, and then I was like, oh, I'll just go to bed. There's nothing we can do. We'll see what happens the next morning. And and the reason it hit me is I, kn I understand that apps are using Silicon Valley Bank, lots of apps in the ecosystem. And if I think about the last eight years of my career dealing with all these apps and these companies, every single time somebody pays for dinner, buys a drink at a bar, it's a Silicon Valley bank card. It doesn't matter what country their app's from, they're all doing business with Silicon Valley Bank. And then there's a second layer, which is really more concerning, and I tweeted this out early fr Friday mornings, like, hey, if anybody's seeing missing payments because of AR and AP, and I didn't even think about payroll. So Silicon Valley Bank offers rails. So an app can use API calls and move money on the train tracks of Silicon Valley Bank. So you could have a client using an app and have exposure to Silicon Valley Bank and not even know it, even though they don't bank there. And to show kind of how complicated this is before we show kind of the apps we're tracking, Blake, mm -hmm. I put a link to a tweet with a screenshot. So this is the footnotes of the website Bluevine. So Bluevine is a bank. So you could be at a whole different bank, Bluevine, small yeah. business bank, and their bill pay part of their product stores those funds at Silicon Valley Bank. So it shows how layered and complicated this can get really fast. If you so Blue Vine, oh, yeah, yeah, I see it now. We, we, got, it, we got it up on the yeah. screen. So you made a list of apps that are affected. Let's talk about which apps, right? Yeah. Because 
uh, even though the FDIC announced that depositors are going to be covered, funds that were in process on Thursday, Friday, like I, I have doubts as to whether or not that money is actually going to get delivered on time, right? Because the bank was shut down, new bank opened up, right? Do they have the same account numbers, same routing numbers? Like what's going to happen? They say the checks are going to clear, but are they really? So let's let's get into that. Yeah. So, so payroll was the first thing because people are watching their bank accounts for paychecks and they didn't show up. So Rippling was one of the first companies to really be proactive talking about this. And they instantly started moving things to Chase, uh, JP Morgan Chase Rails instead. But so all the, a lot of the payroll companies, um, one of the big, Patriot, apparently they had a way deeper relationship, not just their payroll rails, their company itself. A lot of funds were there. And then you start hearing about Bill.com, Melio, uh, Modern Treasury uses them to move money, Sports Engine. So like that's a website where maybe not for, you know, small businesses, but any of your kids are in sports and you're paying those mm -hmm. le those dues, that money, Etsy payments aren't coming through, right? Um, Airbase acknowledged, Avalara. So maybe there's a sweep account that's at Silicon Valley Bank because they're using their APIs. Now, what happens to those funds? Do they get paid to the government? So that's kind of where these relationships are. And then, you know, Bill.com came out and said you know, they had secondary accounts there, right? It wasn't their primary bank. It was a secondary bank, but they still right. had like $350 million there. So my whole thing is like the ripple effect. And I don't think we've documented it. I only have 40 apps. I have some confirmations on. I think so, it's hundreds. So these apps now, here up I at the top, these are the ones that are like the, were the most impacted, right? Obviously, like Patriot was the big one because they, they only used SVB. From what you could tell, yeah, yeah, in their documentation. Yeah. And, and then there's a bunch of scroll down that from we've gotten feedback, they have no exposure, which is good. So there's apps a little lower, there's no exposure. ADP but, uh, is good, you know, Gusto's good, all of these paychecks, practice now, ignition, ramp, no now exposure, because of the relay. Bailout, I do think there is some, and then I'll show up after this. I do think we're over a major catastrophe because if companies were banking with them, whatever app it is, so AppX was using them as their primary bank and they can't get that money out, they probably only had two week, two to four weeks of payroll left and they probably had to shut down their app, which would have been a much bigger ripple effect across the board. Mm -hmm. But I imagine the APIs and the rails, like those are gone now. So these apps are going to have to come up with new, new, new procedures for that. But yeah, so it's just that ripple effect. And then because of this now, I suspect bill, so payroll was Friday, yeah. but I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday this week, you're going to realize if bill pay came or not. We had a pending payment, Blake, you and I had a pending payment coming through bill.com, but I think it was sent on Wednesday, which means it made the ACH clearinghouse by Friday, which then we got it today. But if somebody sent something probably Thursday, it's probably not going to show up if you're expecting money right. um, that came through through some of these apps. You might not That's, see it Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, and it's hard to track because it's ARAP, right? It takes longer to yeah. know when so, it comes. So, so basically what I'm hearing is like we, we – we know that payrolls are going to get reprocessed, right? Rippling's going to be able to process payroll. I mean, that's what you guys are hearing, right? Like, um, uh, I imagine Patriot will be okay. And everyone will have to reprocess, but it'll be fine. We're not sure about the AP and the AR component. Like, are those payments going to make it? We probably should be advising clients as to the uncertainty of that. Um, let me go to you first, Matthew. What, what are you? How many Acuity clients were affected by this? What are you telling them? What are you advising other accountants to tell their clients? Yeah, I mean, we have a vertical in both crypto and, and tech. So um, we had uh, just under 100 clients um, affected by this. Um, so the, the the things we're, we're, we're saying, we're, it was, there's three immediate actions. Um, the first action is to set up a secondary bank account. And the CEO of Relay has been really helpful for our clients in getting us some help um, over there. Uh, they weren't affected by this. Um, and they also are, have an additional product for the people with over 250 K and, and, and so they can have additional FDIC. So we can talk about that later. That's not really for right now. So number one, get your secondary bank account set up. Number two, stock, stop the inbound. So you have all the inbound apps that, that we use. Think of any merchant processing account, uh, Stripe, uh, Chargeify, all of them, right? Stop where that's going. Make sure that's going to the secondary account and not to one of these accounts that's frozen. Uh, we should be able to- books payments as well. QuickBook payments is a, is a great example of, of one you should be thinking about. So anything that's depositing in the bank account, uh, make sure you redirect that to the bank account you have access to. And then the, the third thing we're recommending immediately, and these are all today items because payroll is pulling from lots of people um, for the uh, March 15th payroll today. Make sure if, you, if you've moved money, 
that your payment accounts um, have been changed for Bill.com, Rippling, uh, Gusto, any of those things. Rippling has been uh, sent comprehensive uh, explanations about what things to do. So they have moved to Chase. So if you're a Rippling customer, they've sent a comprehensive list because they were affected so that, to, to minimize the effect. So those are the top three things, Blake, we're starting with, and, and we're just trying to triage from there. There's lots of long-term things to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, no, good points. What about you guys? What about uh, you know Shay, Mike, Ray? What are you telling clients? I, I mean, yeah. from, from my side on Thursday and Friday, I think the, the biggest thing I realized was that our clients don't know their account and routing numbers. And uh, we don't also know that. And if we look at, if you look at any Silicon Valley bank statement, what you're going to see is all of the, the account number is masked and you just have the last four numbers, right? So th that was like a significant thing is who should be in custody of that information. And uh, us as the accountants, do we necessarily want to keep all that information on our uh, drives? Probably not. Um, but who at the company should be in custody of that? I think just something as basic as that uh, now needs to be completely rethought because in a crisis, on Thursday and Friday, when people are trying to send wires at like breakneck speed, you know, you miss a digit, <laughs> you're going to be sending uh, right. wires to the wrong place. I mean, that was That's the biggest right. thing that I saw. And uh, at that point, segregation of duties just kind of went straight out the window, right? Because it's like, who, who's actually making these wire transfers? An assistant? Uh, there were folks who were at South by Southwest last week. So the founder wasn't even in front of like a computer. They were like at a conference speaking or in the audience. And uh, yeah, so, so I, I think there's so many issues that just came up in that crisis that need to be thought through how, if, if something like that happens again, how are we going to uh, deal with a crisis like that? I know it's unprecedented and a bit of a black swan event, but it, it, it's something that needs to now be thought through. So make yeah. sure I hear you correctly there on that. So I'm a small business owner and I'm kind of lazy. And so every time I need my bank account information, I just log into the website and it's there and it's convenient. It's on the website. But if the website goes away, you're right. I don't have my bank account information. Right. Like it's almost like step one, like document and put that somewhere. Right? And we, and Shay and I were worry about anything about else because right? we don't have that. How are you supposed to make a claim and get your money? Shay and I were joking about this. So thinking about that is actually important because, you know, you have the last passes out there, but even those can't be trusted with, you know, banking information that you could likely put. Um, so to piggyback off of that, off of what Matt said, there's definitely that blocking and tackling that needs to happen with the account transfers and the setups. The other thing that I, I definitely want uh, our teams thinking through is cybersecurity or just data in general, right? At these types of moments, there are people that want to take advantage or could take advantage of the chaos. So who you're giving information to, where you're sending that information, where you're storing that, that's incredibly important. And the second thing, actually, just in speaking to a lot of legal counsel, and I'm, I'm hoping and assuming, at least with a lot of our clients, that they're in touch with legal counsel, is when you're moving money, a lot of these companies that bank with SVB had lines of credit. They had uh, venture debt that they, they taken out. And those contracts and agreements legally actually didn't allow you to move that money. So before you go ahead and move that money, just definitely check in with legal counsel, understand the ramifications, uh, because that debt is still going to be on the books and owed and a lot of the restrictions may or may not apply. So that's something that you definitely want to think about as you're moving money uh, before you do it. Yeah, I, I, we, we have roots here in Silicon Valley. So I, I was affected in multiple ways by this. Um, and I would take one step back because we're talking about companies and clients that use SVB, but there's a layer up top of that, um, you know, depositors who we're talking about. But what if they were an employee? What if they were an investor? What if they were an unsecured credit holder? And what if they were a borrower? And if you're a borrower and a depositor, there's a lot of chatter going on that they're going to offset before they liquidate. So now what does that do to your cash flow downstream? So there's a lot of permutations and angles here that go beyond just if you're a company that's a depositor there. Um, and then there's second tier effects. So what if one of my customers or my clients is there and their cash is tied up and they're going to be late paying my AR. You know, I'm not just talking about me and my firm. I'm talking about our clients as well. So there's a lot of kind of mapping out and thinking we have to do. The first thing I'm saying is don't panic. I think that the FDIC stepping in, 
tells me in a certain way that the money at SVB is probably some of the most stable money right now, <laughs> right? It's going to be available. Um, and so map out the cash sources and uses, evaluate your balance sheet, both all, all, all sides, identify your alternative banks where you're going to start spreading out your risk over the 250K, start moving the funds, reconfigure your apps and communicate. And oh, by the way, this probably all needs to be done today and tomorrow. Oh, and uh, just yeah. to add to that, right, more blocking and tackling, make sure you have your bank account reconciled as of an appropriate date. Like there's so much money that was going in and out at any given March point. 10th. Yes, this yeah. is your basic staff accounting type work, right? But you're, you're definitely going to want to make sure you're you're properly reconciling your account. Yeah, one of, one of the main things when you think of the things that we've done today uh, at Acuity is we've sent global notices to all of our employees. Uh, our insurance uh, carriers been in contact with us about the phishing. There's a spike currently in phishing and fraud attempts, uh, specifically with messaging around SVB uh, and Signature and uh, Silvergate even, uh, who are the three primary banks that have been in the news. So one of the things uh, we always tell people, like what, what I was telling people on Friday was be concerned, don't don't panic. And then we have to be measured as we're going through this, like people are relying on us to be thoughtful and systematic as we approach these things. So disconnecting the inbound to the and putting that to the right of bank, right? Um, being really thoughtful about which payments are scheduled for today and tomorrow and Wednesday, right? We've got to be systematic about that. When we get an email right now, we've got to make sure we're validating it's from that from those things. So none of our normal protocols go out of place, right? I don't know what you guys have in your firms, but we have a we try not to take custody of anybody's cash in the event that somebody's given us custody or forced one of our CFOs to take custody because they, they've kind of absolved it. We have a requirement here, like anytime we move over $10,000, you have to do a verbal verification with the person that sent you the email. Those are just normal protocols we have in place that a lot of our clients should have in place when they're doing these transfers. So like we can't, we can't like just react, right? We've got to go back to the basics is what we have in place and make sure we're really thoughtful guys. Like this is the time for the accountants to shine hopefully because we're measured, we're responsible and, and we can really think through some of these things. But like some of the non-intuitive things that people were missing last week were the inbounds and outbounds that are already connected to these banks from their things. And we're gonna have to really think about which apps are like doing that <laughs> from like, you might have your credit card, like that you, you, you're supposed to make a payment today. That's like on an auto pay, right? And it's yeah, pulling right. from an account that's frozen, right? You don't want your credit card to be stopped. Payroll's number one though today. Yeah. yeah. So, so I think those are great tips for the immediate, any, any, any other tips for like what we should be doing today, tomorrow? Uh, I mean, this is, I think if we take everything we talked about, I love checklists. So if you have your controls in place where, let's say, for example, you know who you're supposed to double check with before a wire goes out the door or whatever the case is, just build a checklist for your team um, or your client if you're sort of embedded with the client. Um, I think that's like, it's incredibly important uh, given all that's going on. And then um, save that checklist for the next run, right? <laughs> yeah. Also, you know, the Silicon Valley Bank website is, I mean, the account sec where you can log into your accounts is back up. So I would definitely recommend signing in there. So if there's some type of a lock in First Republic Bank, signing in there, download bank statements, download bank activity. As accountants, that many of us who are on the outsource side, we may have read only access into a lot of these platforms. So I think at the bare minimum, that's something that we could probably do is just pull the basic information in case uh, there's any sort of future lockouts. Uh, when I was looking at the FDIC FAQ as well, uh, I, I, I'm guessing unless there's a buyer that's going to come in for these assets, that there's some sort of a, a time limit that this uh, online banking will be open. So I don't know if that's, that's going to be a significant amount of time or short. Um, so we, I, I guess just getting into the accounts and pulling as much data as possible uh today would be uh probably prudent yeah i mean luckily these aren't these aren't major frauds that cause these this is not ftx everybody also so the fdic right. faqs are very helpful it is explaining to people they have all of svb's records 
Like you don't have to do these things like best practices. Yes. Pull your statements and stuff like that just because you want to know, but they have all the SVV records. They know what's going on. Um, if you have loans, um, there's also a provision you could offset your cash balances with the loans. This was pre the Sunday ruling. Um, so some of the people were going to be able to offset because a lot of the venture debt that people had, they just took out the debt and put it in their cash accounts. So they're like, oh, if you're going to wipe out my cash, you're going to wipe out my loan. There's Q&A on that. The FTIC has actually done a really good job getting information out. Like you have to like this is way different than 08 to me because there's a plan in place and they're running a playbook. Um talk about what you want about everybody, but like this is, it's been a really helpful source of information for our clients and for us. Ray, I think you had something you wanted to add. Nope. Well, maybe, yeah, I, oh, I, Matt, I was just saying maybe I, the first step then is to digest that fact. Yeah, I, I would, I would just repeat that it, it's a time to be measured. It's a time to be professional about it. It's a time to not go crazy and overreact. It's, it is, as Matt said, it's definitely you want to stick to your internal controls. You don't want this to be an opportunity for further harm and risk to you or your clients. So really stick to that playbook. I, I do like the, you know, the two factor authentication, if you will, of an email and a voice call or that in the text, two different channels. It should be a different number because if someone pirates a phone, et cetera, we all know all this, the deep fakes, et cetera. So just be aware that this is happening. So run your place, help your clients, stabilize the situation. It's not on fire, but, you know, I was telling people le last night, luckily after FDIC made the announcement, everyone's going to be covered, no limits. At least we don't have to sprint today, but we still have to run. <laughs> you know, we got to jog along at a pretty healthy pace and kind yeah. of run, but we don't have to sprint, but we do have a lot of stuff to do. So let me Can stick I with you, Ray, for a second. Um, do you think we're out of the woods yet? Absolutely I mean, not. No okay. way. So, um, so what risks should we be advising clients on if we're not saying apocalypse averted? Right. What, you know, what, what do we say? Well, apocalypse averted for now. What could happen? Right. So, look, I think proper governance is, again, we're going to have multiple accounts where you're insured that you're not over FDIC insurance. So you get to take your total cash balance, divide by 250. Some banks have sweep products where you can get up to a million and still end up with FDIC insurance because of the, how the sweep function works. So just research that, figure it out, and don't allow yourself to have risk above those limits, okay? Mm -hmm. um, uh, number two is it's a great time to, to remind all your people that are involved to bolster the internal controls to avoid scams. You know, play defense here at the same time um and then it 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 i think as practitioners as as cloud accounting professionals it reminds me i i spoke to several bankers over the weekend at different banks saying look i'm going to be sending a list of recommend you know of referrals to, to my clients and say hey we need to spread your money out here's some people we should be talking to let me know who you're interested in you should have this network in place. And if you don't, this is a message to all everyone in the profession. Develop your network among the various communities, bankers, lawyers, et cetera, so, you know, uh, investment advisors. So when these situations happen, you have a resource and a pool to go to. Um, I've templated out a very simple four sentence message to clients that were saying, hey, you have a concentration over the FDIC limit. Recent events tell us we shouldn't do that. Let's schedule a call to, to to get our next steps. And every client has been very responsive and receptive to that. And, and you know what kind of blew my mind about this whole crisis was how few people understand that there are already services out there to mitigate this risk by spreading your money out at multiple banks. When I was the bookkeeper at a non nonprofit, a small nonprofit years ago, we had this service and it was actually through First Republic Bank, which is one of those banks that everybody was worried about, where if we had money over $250,000, our banker would automatically invest it in CDs at other banks. And the service I learned this weekend is called Intrify. And there are tons of banks that participate in this and you just got to sign up for it. You know, maybe there's a fee for it, but you know, I, just the fact that so many people had millions of dollars in one bank and didn't think that's a potential risk kind of just shocks me. Well, some of them, Blake, I think part of their, when they took the VC money, right. it's kind of in their agreements. I mean, you yeah. must use this bank. You must keep your funds here. You're not allowed yeah. to take the funds and move them other places. 
Yeah, yeah. that was and, part of the part of the problem with SVB is it was such an incestuous relationship between the VCs, SVB, and the and the startup client that there was money being lent back and forth in all directions and deposit accounts. Those relationships and they kept it in that circle. And while that pl game plan was running for the last thirty five plus years, it was great for everybody until you realize that there's this concentration risk and you get a run on the bank and then you're screwed. Yeah, and, and SVB I, also I, has I, uh, yeah. uh, uh, sweep accounts as well, but yeah. um, I think a lot of folks had left money in checking accounts or money market mm -hmm. accounts, and uh, and 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 the way that their advisors were sort of advising how to allocate the funds is also an issue. So something that, yeah, definitely yeah. for the future we need to. Well, one thing that I, one thing that I found, and it's going to definitely be something that people think about moving forward is a lot of clients were being advised by SVB people themselves, right? So there probably was an independence and it's not just an SVB thing. A lot of, you know, there's other banks and institutions that issue venture debt when uh, companies raise around, for example, those clauses are part of the course. So, I mean, one thing we probably can't, obviously definitely can't answer here is what do those clauses look like uh, for that type of instrument moving forward? Yeah, it seems like unwise. I think everybody's going to be reconsidering the risk right. of of bank runs. But I guess it, you know, we forgot because when was the last big bank run? It's been it's been over a decade, right? So yeah. we just got we got complacent. I think the See, big difference here is that um, this bank run was done, you know, from from people's uh, like like it's interesting how these shocks happen and people are doing like they're they're responding to them. Uh, from home, right? It's not like they're running to the bank and actually pulling the money out. It's like we're now doing all. The, I think they're calling this like the smartphone uh, bank run, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, the way that this is happening now, um, and, and I guess we're going to be have to get prepared for more shocks like this to the system. It's like every couple of years, accountants are having to be on the front lines of yeah. this or that crisis, and uh, this is like the new. This is, I guess is getting us battle tested. To, to just deal with this uh every this month is, this every is like year. this is like the meme stocks for banks right where you had a bunch of people in chat rooms pumping up a rumor and having real world consequences right and this was really when you boil it down uh, tell me if you guys agree with this it was a bunch of vcs in a group chat some dumb vcs didn't understand what was happening at the bank and decided to run or they were really smart and they said everybody's going to freak out i'm going to get my money out first and they all chatted about it and that's what set this off right if it wasn't for slack you know maybe this never would have happened so i don't know i don't know how it started off but i will say I, I think someone brought up the prisoner's dilemma right that everybody that i spoke to basically said hey this is unwise a lot of vcs in my space and biotech didn't even want to move their money but i think no one had a choice at one point when everyone realized everyone else was doing that um but it, your, it reminded me of like the start of the pandemic right yeah. like when people were look uh logging into the ppp um applications like as soon yeah. as the portals were released it's like uh, we're, we're kind of getting into this mode now where we're responding to panic and we're all rushing to to do something and we're getting more and more impacted by fear uncertainty doubt right fud i mean that's that's what's running through through us now i think i saw a tweet it was like uh svp is the victim of the attention economy yeah. Right. yeah, like it, it, it's just too much attention, and it, they're a victim of their own attention because they wanted all the VC attention, right? right? And they're the victim of it. But I want to rewind about risk just to clarify, and I think some of the payroll apps are on the chat, so it'd be great if, so if they could chime in. Rippling made a comment that all the customers, every client of Rippling, was insured up to two hundred fifty thousand, and so I just before the before the the bailout happened on on Sunday, right? So. I just have a, I, I want to understand that better because like everybody, all of us have worked with payroll companies, right? And they kind of do that sweep of your funds out of your bank account. Are they establishing individual bank accounts for just your company at whatever bank they're using to sweep these funds in and out of, or are they all grouped together? And I never got a clarification from rippling on that uh, through social media. There was a, tw a Twitter thread. So I'm just wondering, do you guys have any idea on how that works with payroll companies? Are your funds segregated out? I, I would imagine, look, th those are fiduciary funds, right? They at, at the point that that income is earned and you're processing payroll, the money no longer belongs to the company. That's why the government gets so pissed off when, when you know, starving startups with cash flow problems don't 
forward the pay withheld payroll tax to the government. You, you get in personal liability for doing that. So they, everybody takes payroll super seriously, more so than anything else. And if, if for rightful, rightful reasons as well. So I would, I would expect, and I don't know this for a fact, but I would be shocked if it were not the case that for payroll accounts, because of the fiduciary trust relation, you know, trust account relationship, that those have to be individually insured. I would, I, I'd be shocked if it were otherwise. Maybe we'll get some of the payroll companies to chime in on that and how that technically works. But I assume it's similar to some kind of escrow account, guys, um, that, that has a different uh, set of FDIC parameters or insurance parameters um, just based on how they set it up. These are, I mean, ADP is not going to have FDI. I mean, I mean, ADP, Gusto, like Rippling, all these guys are have negotiated this with banks uh, so to protect people, I assume. So, so this this brings up a really good point about how we protect our firms and thus our clients is when we do our due diligence on apps, are we now going to have to ask the question, what are your payment rails? Do you have multiple banking relationships? I would not personally want to work with a payroll company that only has one bank at this point, right? That makes no sense. And oh, saw, come on, Blake. Let's, let's have that. a reasonable standard here. Like, Blake, let's, come on. Like, let's, define, let's, let's, uh, not, let's not overreact here. <laughs> can you define payment rails, Blake, for anybody in the audience? I think, well, a, lot I, of people, I think a lot of people don't know what that is. Yeah, yeah, right. So they're, they're, you're processing ACH payments, and you have to do it through a bank. And so if you only have one bank that you have a relationship with to process ACH payments on behalf of your customers and that bank stops working um, for whatever reason, it could be that there's a run on the bank, but it also could be that there's simply a technology failure that's going to disrupt all the payments for all your customers, whether that's payroll or that's accounts payable. Uh, it's, it's, it's the ACH network goes through banks, right? Um, I, I think, let me know, David, if you think there's a better way to describe that, but that's how I understand it. Yeah, so, I mean, it's train tracks, right? And you're just adding train cars on these train tracks. So if the train tracks are ever gone and you had money in one of those train cars, I don't know where it's at, right? Well, if it never I, made it to the finish. You have to remember that we're talking about a risk that's only for amounts over $250,000 because none of these, none of the people that I've seen is using a non-FDIC insured bank right. for rails, guys. So, I mean, let's, let's be a little bit measured with some of these things. I don't know. Yeah, because we I need just, to trust the systems essentially right i mean the fdic is there uh, so we don't even have to think about these types of problems if we're going to have to start factoring it in then we got bigger problems well no um, i i i disagree i i think blake that you're right on that point that i think that in order to advise clients properly it's good to know this on the back end you it, it's it's a foreseeable issue why would you not as a professional in this space track that so yes, I would want to know what the rails are, and I would want to be sure that every client had multiple accounts, bank accounts, that could bypass one set of rails if they needed to very easily. My clients who had multiple bank accounts open at the same time, and there's several of them, um, for a variety of reasons, I'm not going to name names. It, it, it was super easy to just move money from here to there internally and and go. Now, if, if your money's stuck in one bank, at least you have some in another, right? So you don't over-concentrate at any of them as well. So it, it, it's important to know this stuff. And I think, yeah, the world's changed. We got to know it now. We got to track it. And bring this smaller scale, right? And Blake brought this up on Twitter. A lot of our clients or you know, the clients of listeners of this podcast attending this webinar are small businesses and they are living week to week. So if a payment, yeah, sure, it's insured. You're going to get your $5,000 payment that was sent on these rails, but maybe it's going to take three weeks. Right. They kind of need that $5,000. They kind of need it, right, to pay their employees or to pay their rent, right? So it, this is like, it doesn't, like the companies having backup rails where they can reroute money is going to be important. Apps are going to have to change the way they build their own internal stacks and what technology they build on and who they partner with. It can't be exclusives anymore. Yeah, it's a good comment here by Lisa. It basically just says exactly that, like how they're using multiple relationships now. So I think um, to your point, yeah, that's, uh, you know, what, now when we start asking those questions, like who's the bank behind the payment rails, they're going to say, well, it's this list of 10 banks, you know? <laughs> Right, and that should right. be a that should probably be a standard disclosure, right? Somewhere right. on the landing page somewhere. I mean, I mean, this is standard part of risk management, right? Like you're talking about counterparty risk. Like we talk about this in crypto all the time when we're trying to 
get people to be like just sane, right? You're like, okay, when you are doing these things, you walk your clients through counterparty risk, right? So in this case, like if your if your bank was, you know, FDIC, FDIC insurance, like if you are exceeding those thresholds and not using one of these products, you're exposed to counterparty risk and talk about what counterparty risk is, guys. For the apps, yes, sure, you can know which one their rails are. Um, and, and if you want to do a bunch of diligence and know they have a secondary rails, that's fine. But like all this at the end of the day is just counterparty risk. So now that the FDIC has stepped in and guaranteed all deposits unlimited, is there really an FDIC limit anymore? I mean, they've set a precedent now. I think everybody's just going to assume that their their money's safe if it's deposited at a bank. Yeah, you, yeah. you, you, you can't do that. And it's interesting. Kenji just uh, uh, Karamuto just made that comment as well. Sim- similarly, I, I you know no you can't. I mean, is did it happen in this case? I think that there was the fear, which is actually happening. You know, you, you keep CNBC on in the background. There, the, the bank stocks are getting crushed today. And there's a lot of fear in the out there. Had the FDIC not stepped up 6.15 p.m. Eastern on a Sunday night to, to increase the 250 limit to be, you know, we'll cover everything. Could you imagine how the market opening would have been today? It, it, it just So they, they had to do this to avoid this risk. What they're going to be doing in the meantime is, oh, my God, what about something like Dodd-Frank? And hmm, was it Mnuchin and, and company who uh, reduced those limits tenfold? It's like, you know, there were these regular, we've lived through this once, we're now we're again, and we had the controls in place and they got lifted. It's like, I'm sorry, everybody hates regulations, but sometimes there's a reason for it. Yeah, I think I think that's where we kind of shift to at some point later in the week, <laughs> getting to our clients about the long-term treasury planning for people over right. 250K. So that's going to have to be a thing. It's going to have every, every one of those conversations is going to have two components. Do you have a secondary bank account set up just with money in it to have it uh, have it there just in case? And do you have a treasury policy for when your balances go over 250K? Like and those Matt, are the two things you're going to have to make sure that they're going to include. Matt, to, to really just figure out back off what you just said, this is an observation that I had way early this morning. I'm noticing because of the sophistication that now is accessible to smaller companies, companies that are earlier stage right with that and i tweeted about this with that comes the sophisticated risk that you typically would have in the past seen at larger companies so one of the more practical things that i know and i remember from you know a lot of my public companies is a a concept or a report called the SOC one report and for any of you that obviously studied for some sort of exam or have come across this a SOC one report has two types and really that that takes like an svb for example And it requires them to get audited and to share with you, a user of their platform, their controls and their systems that they have in place. These things already exist, but for like public companies. So like Sarbanes-Oxley requires these types of things, right? And now what I'm seeing is people like us now have a responsibility for like the earlier stage companies, like the Series A, B, and even before to actually assess that same, whether it's counterparty risk or um, concentration risk, and ask those same questions. So I'll I'll give you one example is a, there's a company out there that wanted to create software for clinical trial finances, finances. So I talked to them and was really trying to understand what they wanted to do because I didn't want to bring them and put them in front of my clients. Well, they didn't even have a SOC one report. And my message to them was, hey, if you want to play in the big leagues and you want people to trust you, you got to get that report and be able to show it. And number, number two on that is that has to be reported or audited by a, um, an institution that you trust. So there's a lot of shops in my space, a lot of shops that are popping up that are giving a stamp of approval for these reports and they're, they're not legit. They're um, automating. They're, yeah. They're just, they're just turning uh, reports out. Right. You get these companies to get in front of companies that will pay, that will build their trust. So uh, that's uh, Mike, that's the, the, the well. big, I think the bigger point that you're bringing up here and because I, I saw some tweets about, Oh, you know, uh, you CFOs need to be blamed for this. And it's right. like, hold on, there are companies raising upwards of 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollars, and there is no finance function mm. at these startups. There is no right. CFO. Um, they are dependent on outsource, outsource accountants such as us, and then they're using fractional executives to handle the rest, right? There's no internal exactly. finance function. I mean, even at FTX, I mean, there was the whole 
they're using QuickBooks and there wasn't really any oversight. So I think the, the longer these companies um, stay private and, and they keep raising money, um, uh, there isn't enough internal uh, motivation from the board to put finance people in place to take this responsibility. And like, you know, right. most of us around here, we're, we're all the outsourced folks trying to step in and help where we can. But like, ultimately, the companies need to be now I think that that that's what something that comes out of this is if you raise a series A round, you should really be thinking about installing like a full time finance hire at that point. So I, I want to emphasize this because I think this is like very important uh, sweep accounts, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't know what they are. Can we just reiterate how they work and you know, how do you get it's, access to it, that? Why it, you should use them? It, it's a bank product. <clears throat> so the, the your banker, any any you know, good banker, reputable banker, that if you discuss with them about the need for a sweep account, it basically takes all of your money in a, in a, in your demand deposits checking account. And overnight it, it, the balance goes to zero and it's invested in other markets or Europe, Asia, etc. And then in the morning, when you come back and you're back in business and the, and the U S markets open up, the U S banks are open, your money comes back in. Um, and you can earn a percentage on your money overnight. Um, and it does diversify the FDIC insurance. Uh, you can get, I think you can get these sweet products up to like a million or a million two, something like that. Um, you can even get them larger if like, if the, if the one, one startup we work with, they had their money distributed between 120 different banks, like, and each bank had a 250K right. and you see, and you only need one banking relationship really to, to do that. Yeah. yeah. I think, I think you can get a single bank up to 1.2 million ish. And if you use sweep accounts and end up with all of that being FDIC insured, the way it's structured, if they structure it properly, but th that's what sweep accounts are uh, uh, like for the audience. Okay. Yeah. No, thank you for that. I think this is really important because I mean, obviously a lot of people in Silicon Valley have no idea of this concept. I am kind of shocked that the VCs didn't, advise their founders on this. Like, I understand why founders wouldn't know about this because they're just trying to run a business. They aren't, most of the time, they're not finance people, they're not accounting people. But like, where were the VCs in all of this not advising their portfolio companies on treasury risk management? Like, you'd think I mean, that they could at least do a do a little bit of, you know, coaching on this, but they- like they're, they're so, I think from what I'm seeing, VCs are, well, let's take a step back, right? What happened earlier last year was a lot of people started focusing more on cash flow because they realized they weren't raising funds. And I think at that point, that sort of forced VCs to, you know, double click a little bit more. But even still, I'm seeing a lot of VCs are still far removed. And a lot of VCs honestly haven't operated a company. So they're not going to really un often understand some of the nuts and bolts of setting up a sweep account to sweep, you know, anything above 250K into something that's um earning you some return and, and a little bit safer so um there's a disconnect there for sure well and it's un under 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 appreciation of risk right you know a, if bank runs never happen or don't ever happen everybody everybody knows about why well, i shouldn't say everybody but you know i most people in this profession are aware of the two hundred fifty thousand dollar fdic limit heck read the cash paragraph of any audit gap audit report First thing it says is, hey, the client has more than 250K above the FDIC limit. There's a risk there. It's in the audit footnotes. Everybody's Oof. the kind of knows about that. And everybody reads them. the audit footnotes, right? right? <laughs> they don't? But Lisa, Lisa oh. says, would the sweep account really help in the circumstance as you described cash being held overnight and coming back during business hours? Matthew, you replied that it depends on the product. I, I, the, way yeah. it worked, well, the way it worked when I had one at the, the company I worked for is that the the excess cash was invested in short-term CDs that had a maturity date of a month, two months, three months, six months, whatever. And we had a rolling set of CDs that were, you know, coming mature. And so we always had enough cash to operate, but not enough to be at risk. Uh, I'm sure it could work in a variety of ways. So yeah. Mike said, let's not forget the VCs themselves were parking large amounts with SVB and how they handled capital calls. Yeah, this is a this is an interesting one because most of the the VCs and private equity firms use SVB and Signature Bank for their lines of credits for short term capital calls. So in the in the in the inter intermediate term, if they cannot get lines of credit this week, guys, uh, you can expect if you're 
LP and a venture fund or a private equity fund to be uh, getting a capital call uh, as an investor, which is just fascinating. Well, well, this is part of that echo that I was talking about in the in the risks. Uh, we don't know yet what's going to what what's really going to hit from all of this stuff. And we're not going to know for several days and weeks and even a couple months. Um, there's going to be there. There's some stuff on SVB's balance sheet that's incredibly valuable. They've got warrants in all these startups, biotech companies. It's uh, you know AI, uh, you know all kinds of stuff that's that's pretty valuable. These companies are really going to hit it. They just don't have time to wait for this to come to fruition, two, three, five years down the road. Someone's going to pick up that asset for theoretically lower than what it should be valued at because of the fire sale. Um, you know, so there, there's just all kinds of stuff. There's VCs that were borrowing from SVB that what are they going to do now? They're going to have their own liquidity crisis. Some of their portfolio companies are going to go out. There, there's going to be a, an extinction of some otherwise very viable and valuable tech companies that under other circumstances would have been very successful in three years, but they're not going to make it through this event. Because their upstream funders are going to now run out, have a liquidity problem, and can't fund them in, in today. So there's just all kinds of stuff going on here that um, we're, we're not going to know in the moment. Which brings us back to what do we do today, this week, the next couple of days, and we got to stay in touch on this going forward. Yeah, I was kind of thinking about the uh, Mike. You brought up how the um, you know public companies have to do this SOC compliance and they have to disclose here's all our banking partners here's how we're you know this is all in those SOC reports right maybe there's opportunity for the intuits and zeros of the world like for example intuit has the quickbooks app store apps on that store cannot be listed if they don't go through a huge security review Great right idea. so they're testing them from a security perspective but maybe all these apps and these companies quickbooks zero etc before you list these apps in your store you got to do a little diligence on their financial backing because to some extent too if you put an app in the app store and, and take out a bank collapse out of this they just don't run their business very well right financially and then the app goes away now you got to move your clients off of there so maybe there's an opportunity for an intuit and zero and arguably you know sage and sage as well right when you put these apps on your app store to vet out the redundancies they have under the covers when it comes to money movement there's yeah, I, mean, uh, I mean the there there's definitely an opportunity for Zero and QuickBooks to give accountants in our dashboards better insights to which banks yes. our clients are using in a reporting way. <laughs> I can guarantee that <laughs> after doing that across 700 clients this week and evaluating <laughs> not just apps, but also bank accounts. Like uh, this takes bank feeds to another whole new level, guys. Like this is this problem. So this is like trying, this is like a serious, this is just a crazy crisis of data this week. All also, right. do, do we need, uh, I mean, do we need to step back and also say that is is this just part of the risk that we take in giving the startups the freedom to innovate and, and build and, the, you know, this collapse and what's happened is just part of um, that aspect of things? Because if we start tightening up things too much, is it just going to de-incentivize um, uh, innovation? You know, are we, are we kind of uh, putting t too tight of a grip on it. So I, th I think there's a balance there that needs to be struck. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I, let's, let's, let's just say ahead. what, I mean, collapse, the only collapses are the two banks right now, just to be fair. Like the, the, the problem, the financial problem that the two banks had logistically, this was a relatively inexpensive, like fix from the FDIC insurance coffers. Like we're talking about maybe single digit billions, maybe, maybe $10 billion total to cover the holes if you liquidated their portfolios today. So like when we say collapse, let's be measured with that as well, because like the actual problem here when we dig into it was the available for sales securities. Literally, these guys were buying five-year treasuries at 2%, right? Or mortgage bonds at 2% that were five-year maturities, right? Those are those things when they come to maturity are full value, guys. They had a short-term liquidity crisis. So I just... Before we say collapse and like that kind of stuff, let's let's go back to the actual problem and, and, and not scare the crap out of everybody. <laughs> All right, yeah. guys, we got 10 minutes left. So uh, I think it was uh, Shay had an idea or Mike. Mike said, let's do a summary of takeaways. I think that's a great idea. So I'm going to go around. We'll go around one more time. Y'all get, you know, one, two minutes. Tell us what are your key takeaways from this? What's your advice to your fellow accountants? 
Ann, we'll wrap things up that way. Um, Shay, well, let's go around. We'll go around clockwise from you. Unless you want us pass and come back. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think like just to summarize what everyone's been saying, you know, diversifying the risk, opening up uh, multiple bank accounts, at least uh, bank accounts that have insured cash sweep account functions. I see that already Brex and others are sort of competing on that and tr trying to say how much they're insured over. Um, so that I think that's like a easy first step. Second step, um, you know, the payment rails, yeah, look into maybe, especially for payment rails that you may be highly dependent on or at, or look into which, who's sort of behind those, uh, behind the curtain um, using those. And then I think finally, um, you know, ha having a process in place for knowing what your bank account numbers and routing numbers and what your actual like raw information is so that in the event of an emergency, there is some uh, pathway that you could take or you have that information readily available, um, obviously in a secure place. But uh, that, that, that I think those would be my sort of key takeaways. Matthew. Yeah, I mean, as firm owners in particular, we have a responsibility right now to be really thoughtful and systematic and measured in our response and supporting our folks because our all of our employees are facing this issue with our with this so i'll just tell you what i've done this weekend we've reminded our employees about the the crimes happening the fishing uh the risks uh we've reminded them of those facts we've reminded them of the things we do normally in situations we've prioritized the short-term things that we have to do for people affected create a bank account stop the inbound cash coming in from the variety of things check on the outbound payroll and bill pay and things happening just in this next three days then we've separated that into the long term and now the next thing i have to do is help construct for all these conversations people are going to have about treasury management how we prioritize without a client but that's going to begin with always having a secondary bank account and identifying these fdic products that extend over 250K um, coverage for our clients. That's my summary. <laughs> Blake, are you on mute? Blake, I think you Of might course, be I'm on mute. Uh, <laughs> over to you, Mike. We have a list of impacted apps that we know of at bankcollapseapp.info. You can check that out uh, if you missed the beginning of this stream. Yeah, uh, I will just echo what. Um, the prior two folks said and i will say from a practical st standpoint you should be reconciling your bank activity as of the last time uh svb shut down on you just to understand what actually left the bank what what came in and number two i think i love that the phrase be, being measured and tempered in your approach that also means selecting different um, bank partners right so you want to diversify but make sure you just go through and understand based on where your company is going what kind of bank partner you need, what presence they have, what kind of payments, whether it's foreign currency payments you maybe need to make. There's a whole UK side of this, right, with SVB being in the UK that we haven't thought about. Some of my clients have entities in the UK that use SVB. So just think about that, right? Don't just quickly move to a bank partner out of haste. You, you still have to think through the next few weeks and make that decision. So that's that's what I want people to take away. Awesome. David? I think just slow down. Um, don't do anything for the next set until maybe Wednesday when it comes to signing up for new apps, to sending out payments, things like that, because we're not even one full business day out from this yet. Right. We're, we're like, this happened Friday. It was a weekend. And now we're what, halfway through the first business day. So like, let's, let's see what happens after three business days where everything should be a little bit more calmer and then start making real decisions, moving clients around and stuff. And Ray, you get to take us out here. Woohoo. All right. I, I completely agree with everyone said, um, you know, don't panic. Now is the time as professionals to do analysis, to make decisions or to help clients make decisions and to take action. And you got to do it in that order, right? Ready, aim, fire. You know, it doesn't work out so well when it's ready, fire, aim. So let's just stick to the playbook, not panic assure our clients communicate with them and have a game plan and go for it i think the fdic stepping in to ensure this without limit is super helpful 
Um, I think that it's a big wake up call of a lot of stuff that we need to change. And as a final point, this is what a great opportunity. I hate to say it this way, but what a great opportunity for us as professionals to remind our clients of the value that we can bring to them in times like this. So, you know, let's wrap this up in a couple minutes and get back to work. <laughs> That's right. We had one last question from John come in. I would be curious if any state taxing agencies will have a forgiveness time period for tax payments, right? Maybe you were making that payment at the last moment and SVB shut down, right? You missed the payment deadline. Most of, most of them do. Okay. Most of them do. They have, uh, uh, if you have extenuating circumstances, you can get uh, penalty abatement. I wouldn't worry about that. That's the least of your problems at the moment. Cindy says, thank you so much for holding this special panel and sharing your knowledge. It is super helpful. Kenji said, great webinar, awesome group of panelists, except for Matthew, he was just okay. <laughs> Will Lopez says, thanks everyone. Mickey says, thank you for this webinar. Sasha, thank you. Oh, it was great. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. Oh, dude, uh, you got to put this yeah. on earmark so they get CPE too. Oh, yeah. Actually, that's my final question for you is, do you need CPE? And would you like to earn CPE for having watched this webinar? If enough people type yes into the chat, I'll put it up on earmark as a free CPE course, and you can go get the uh, CPE by taking the, the quiz on the earmark CPE app. And I'm seeing so many yeses. So go to earmarkcp.com if you have not and download the app, sign up, and uh, you can get free CPE credit for attending today. Thanks, guys. I hope you have a great week, and uh, I really appreciate all your advice.